Hello, thanks for having me at the first Mayo Transform virtual conference. Um, my name is Lyle Berkowitz. I'm a physician uh, who's been involved in innovation and informatics for my whole career. Uh, and I'm joined by Jonathan Barron, a successful entrepreneur. We're going to be talking about um, our experience at Transform Conference in 2010 and how that led to a number of fascinating um, new things that we've been able to do and how we've been able to transform ideas into reality, or as we say, make PowerPoint dreams really come true. The agenda today will include a quick background of what led up to that conference a couple of years ago, and then a recap and reflections of what we discussed and what uh, I talked about, both problems and solutions, and um, if they're still relevant today, and then some updates uh, on uh, what uh, I've been involved in in the innovation front over the uh, uh, subsequent years from that conference. So let's go back a few years. Uh, in 2010, uh, I was uh, invited to the uh, Tran Mayo Transform Conference, which I believe was in its second year. Uh, I had a long history as a primary care physician involved in informatics. Um, and in 2007, I'd started uh, with uh, philanthropic funding, uh, the Solozzi Healthcare Innovation Program. Uh, a program that enabled me to um, start thinking about um, the science of innovation, how to bring it into healthcare to focus on the patient and provider experience. Uh, and part of my work there uh, involved creating new ideas and designs as to what the future electronic medical record might look like. Um, as the Mayo Transform had an iSpot contest uh, that I entered and was uh, chosen to make a presentation on a upcoming topic, a uh, hot topic. And what we're going to do right now is actually go back a few years, show you that video, uh, and then reflect on that a bit more because uh, I, I think it's, there's still some uh, re good relevance today and uh, we'll explain how we've jumped from that video uh, and those PowerPoints into uh, creating some very real innovations that are making a, a difference in today's world. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to jump into that video right now. My name is Lyle Berkowitz, and I'm here to tell you the EMR is dead. <laughs> At least what I'm going to call EMR 1.0. I think it died last year. Um, I, I've got to go quick on this, so I'm going to quickly give you a background and then go over some thoughts on what I think EMR 2.0 might lo start looking like. This is important. I, I'm, I, I have a couple of roles. I am a primary care physician. I still see patients. I've been using an EMR since 2002. I've worked and designed on using EMRs in the past. So um, physicians here, some of you using EMR. Why, how did we kill this? Because docs, docs are out here. We keep telling the uh, vendors and IT people, make it look like paper because that's what I'm used to. Big mistake. The problem is it, computers aren't really good at replicating paper. They're good at doing lots of things, but not really good at, at just making things look like paper and act like paper. Paper really is powerful. Second, uh, I'm the medical director of information systems for my group, a large 100 doctor group, 40 internists. And so my job there is to figure out how to optimize the EMR, et cetera, and work with the IT staff. IT people out there, what do you do wrong? You, know, you listen to the doctors, and you, and you just did what you know. You created something that looked like Word, that looked like Excel, tried to make it look like paper, and you know, not much innovative thinking. Um, I'm also the, uh, the founder and director of a nonprofit healthcare innovation program, the Solozzi Healthcare Innovation Program in Chicago. Um, love being able to do that. There I get to think innovatively, and I get to work with designers. I love designers. What do you do wrong? Uh, you just haven't been involved. We need to involve you guys more. Um, so what if we did? What could that maybe look like? I want to think different about how we use data, how we look at data, you know, data visualization, et cetera, and how we use that data. So what do we have? Um, information visualization. This is one slide I didn't create, but I liked it so much I put it up there. I found it online. This guy, a young designer, um, put, documented uh, what his pain was like every day for a month or two. Um, I think it's pretty obvious where his pains are. You know, we're going to maybe start with that knee and triage some other stuff. Um, but this is a way to take in a lot of data and quickly use techniques to make it easier to see things. Uh, anyone use an EMR? It's a typical problem list. 
you know, not, you know, sort of looks like a Word document. Yeah, you know, it, it not really if you doesn't really tell you that much information, but they all look like this. Every EMR, this is what they look like. What if it looked a little different? Can you tell me what the last problem list said and how it prioritized? Can you tell from this what maybe is important based on the size, what maybe is not under good control based on the color, how they're connected to each other? Does that start to make a little more sense? Yeah, you know, there's no reason we can't do this, but we don't. Here's another view of it, maybe a little more e easier, obvious for some people. None of, nothing I'm showing here is absolute. Nothing I'm showing is the, the end game, but it, it, it adheres to what we're trying to do. Think differently. Think differently about how we use data, how we look at data, and particularly with electronic medical records, the power that we have with computers, what can we do differently? Um, I've worked with a couple of graphic designers and all these things I'm showing you, I have no talent whatsoever in that area. Uh, I just sort of describe a few things and some real talented people I found put these up there. And so you'll see their differences because each graphic designer has their own style. One I found, um, I, I just, I love her work. It's very fanciful. Here's her view of the problem list. Um, but again, you can look at that and say, you know, what is significant? what's under control, any of you, doesn't matter if you have any sense of healthcare at all, anyone can look at this and figure it out. And right now what we make the doctor do is we make them dig through lots of information to get all this. We're good at doing that, we can do it, but it's not really the best use of our time. We talk about a, a primary care physician shortage in America. I don't think we actually have a shortage of primary care physicians, I think we have a shortage of using them efficiently because we make them do so much work, so much clicking, so much looking. How can we make that easier? A computer can do that. Here's results. Yeah, this is how we get results. It's an Excel spreadsheet, we're all used to this, etc. but could it be done any better? Could it be done differently? How do we think differently about getting results? So, yeah, I said, well, what if we could look at it from a normalized standpoint? Along the bottom here is what the lab says is normal or high or low. And then along the vertical axis is the change from the baseline for that particular patient. So it makes it a little more personalized. I think everyone can, here can tell there's at least one thing that's way out of range. You don't need the numbers for it. If I had a mouse, you could float over that and it would actually show you the value. Um, well, if there's anyone in the back who can hit on that results Rx button, I'm gonna see if there's some, there are wizards in back. I'm gonna hope they can with a mouse hit on that. Nope, go back and hit on the thing that says results Rx. Keep going to the right, the little blue thing, yeah. Um, this is over time, sort of the same idea of normalized data. Yeah, it would take me a while to scan a bunch of numbers to figure this out, but you can start to see how these are connected. Uh -oh, let's see, and let's see. And go to the right side of the screen. We're gonna keep going through this. Go to the next side, the right side of the screen and click on that white part. Okay, so that's some ways to visualize information real quickly. Different ways, so we can think about it differently. How about using that information? Can we make little widgets and functionalities that are, are context sensitive and actionable? By context sensitive, I mean, tell me what I need to know so I can make a decision. Don't make me go look for everything. Let me give you some examples. So now let's say I get the labs back, and instead of just getting the labs back, I actually get the computer to bring me all the information I need his active medicines, their last appointments, their notes, um, some graphical visualization, and then make it actionable. The computer should be able to figure out what I'm most likely to do. It's really not rocket science. A lot of this stuff is fairly structured, easy stuff, but when I get labs back, I then have to go click all over the place to find all the information I need to process it. You know, we're not perfect, we need extra information. Why not make the computer bring it all together and then tell us what we're most likely to do we can adjust it if needed, but make our lives a little easier. If I'm charting, this is an example you know, of what if I could look at a patient's history and the computer automatically group them into the, d the diseases and, and issues that they have. And furthermore, could tell me hypertension is red. It, you know, we've got some problems with hypertension, it gives me the information I need, tells me what I might want to do. Diabetes, cholesterol, yellow, I have to react to those. Asthma's green, it's under good control. But make the computer bring me information that I need, make it a little easier for me to do this. Here's our fanciful artist again. I asked to do the same thing, but don't use really any words. Pretty much all the same information on the last screen for hypertension, but done in a very graphically pleasing way. This is one of my favorites. 
med refill rigs. Oh, I need my friends in the back to go over some things again. This medication refills, one of my, one of my big bugaboos. Um, when I have to refill a medication, all the EMR doctors float over where it says information, uh, put the mouse there, pulls that up. So it's a little flash animation. Ladies, I need all that information. When I started the medicine, when I, when I um, last saw the patient, when I changed their dose, what the medicine, then this is for a cholesterol medication. I need all that information. In my current EMR, I can click one button to refill, but that's a workflow. The idea of thought flow is that I actually need all that information to make that decision to click that button to say, yes, refill that medicine. I have to go at 25 clicks to get all that information. Why can't it just all come to me automatically? It's the same thing over and over again. We have to start thinking differently about how we use the computer uh, in our workflow. Uh, I can hit change. I can you know, change any of the, the suggestion actions, uh, and it will automatically happen. And then if I do all of that, where does that information go? It should go to the appropriate party, the, the team uh, that I work with. Uh, this last one, I'm going to, I think, I'm going to need the mouse people to start clicking stuff. This got me thinking, what do I, if I am part of a team, how do I, as a physician, want to sort of direct that team? So this idea of a care plan is as follows. So stop there a second. What I did is we pulled this. We're looking at symptoms, vitals, and labs. And we pulled in dizziness. I want dizziness evaluated every two months, say. Uh, I put that into my timing bin. I hit the range, what range I want that studied. And then my team knows what they need to study. For vitals, I might do blood pressure. For labs, I might do other um, diabetes metrics. And then, in the end, they know what I need to control. But I've made a very visually easy way for me to control that. So that's my brief review of th thinking differently with EMRs. Um, if you get one more on the white side, uh, uh, I've also been working on a lot of different things within uh, what we call service line innovations uh, that Lou talked about in a recent article. So if you have any more interest, you can uh, find more of my work at this, the, the shiphome.org. Thank you for your time. So I hope you enjoyed that uh, little time trip and that um, uh, I look back at it and it's always hard to, to look back at it in your own self, but it made me think, you know, what have I done since then and uh, how, um, uh, how good were my, my thoughts? Um, let's talk about the problems first. I was really um, lamblasting the EMR, uh, but I think it's still true. I think this concept of EMR 1.0 is still dying. Uh, it's, it's around, but uh, I, I, I use this phrase, and I continue to use it, that we don't have a shortage of physicians. We have a shortage of using them efficiently, uh, and that's very much based on today's EMR systems that are much more uh, focused on sort of collecting documentation for billing rather than um, figuring out a way to take better care in a more efficient manner. Um, and I still strongly believe that EMR 2.0, the next um, part of EMRs, still need design thinking. Um, and we need to think, how can we make EMRs in a way that improve life for doctors, make us more efficient, while at the same time continuing to improve care for patients? Uh, and over the past couple of years, I've continued to learn a variety of innovation methodologies, which I think are important um, in design thinking. And when we think about what are the solutions that are out there, you know, I continue to think, how might we create systems which embrace the principles that I discussed at that talk? Uh, information visualization, that, that you know, fun way to say, take all that information and create it in a better way than we, we do on paper. Um, how do we use the system to automate and delegate routine care and to create a team-based system? Because the more we can do that, not only do we make care more efficient, and so there are enough doctors to take care of everybody, but we also can improve quality. So I think those things still stand very strong and still influence me a lot to this day. So what have I been up to you know, in, in the past couple of years, and how have those mantras uh, influenced me? Um, I'm going to break it down in three areas. One is, um, how has my job, my career um, changed over the past couple of years? Second, a, a book um, that uh, is based on some of these thoughts. And third, uh, a company that I developed, also based on, on some of these thoughts. Uh, first of all, my job, I'm fortunate to be working at, at one of the best uh, hospitals in, the, in America, the Northwestern Memorial Hospital, uh, and I'm part of the hospital-owned group, a uh, large primary care group, uh, where I am the 
medical director of IT innovation, uh, but for the hospital uh, and larger organization, uh, I am now the associate chief medical officer of innovation. Uh, and so this to me is the best job in the world because uh, I get to you know, think about you know, how can we do things better, um, whether I find something external or um, use innovation methodologies to help create something internally, um, how do we um, find fun facilitate um, these innovative ideas, processes, technologies, and business models? Um, how do I create a culture of innovation that makes people comfortable in, in our organization, as well as do very specific things that increase value for our organization, um, which we define, of course, as improving quality while lowering the cost of care. Big focus on care coordination. Uh, and uh, the, the way I can succeed in this you know, is because we have an organization that really is encouraging this. Uh, literally encourages disruption and failure in my job. I've been brought in to do that, uh, and um, it allows us to try new things. Um, so the the hope is alive with uh, respect to being able to uh, find jobs that do this. I think we're seeing this idea of chief innovation officer becoming um, more important and um, uh, will become, I think, a very important part of uh, the future of healthcare across many organizations. Some of the real-world projects I've been involved in uh, involve a number of things in the outpatient world. Um, one of my favorites is uh, we've been working a lot with poorly controlled or extreme diabetics using an innovation concept called video ethnography to tape record them in their homes to find out how might we better serve them. And we've actually launched a number of um, new projects uh, around uh, what we've learned from that area. I won't go into all these in detail. Um, but suffice it to say, there's a combination of learning what others have done, particularly in this care coordination space, and figuring out how they might apply and be used within our own organization, as well as um, using some classic innovation methodologies to um, create innovative ways to better take care of patients within our own organization. Second thing I want to uh, follow up on is um, a book that I was fortunate enough to be involved in um, with uh, my good friend, Chris McCarthy. Um, I came at it you know, as a physician uh, from my innovation program, Chris McCarthy, uh, who is, uh, helps head up uh, innovation at Kaiser and is a leader of the Innovation Learning Network, a consortium of organizations focused on innovation and healthcare. We came together and helped put together a book with a number of amazing authors, over 20 authors, who told us their stories. Um, and we put it into a framework that I like to talk of as a cookbook of case studies that help educate and inspire in a variety of ways um, to explain how they used innovation and information technology to um, improve something at their organization. More specifically, they told us their stories. Um, and we broke this into three different um, re, uh, general areas. Um, the first section uh, was about EMRs. How did they use EMRs in an innovative way, from care coordina coordination and preventive care to adverse event detection? Um, uh, multiple chapters that re explained the stories of how they did something different with EMRs, something the EMR vendor didn't even count on them doing. We also had a section on telehealth. Um, so many potential options here. Uh, we talked about the very um, classic e-consults and e-visits, um, but not only what those are, but how they succeeded uh, in, uh, in their own organization, uh, as well as some new things like telepharmacy and teletranslators. The last section was about advanced technologies that range from mobile EMRs and smart rooms to analytics dashboards, um, uh, e-panels, crowdsourcing, and of course, gaming. So what are some of the common themes that we learned from that that are important? Um, is that so much of this came from the bottom up, um, that these ideas flourished and piloted. Um, eventually, though, when they succeeded, top-down spread was important as well. Uh, we heard so many of the stories involve overcoming issues in the ecosystem. The technologies themselves were actually um, not the innovation. The innovations were how to come up with new business models and cultural changes and process changes um, that were innovative in an organization that wasn't used to that, and the technology simply facilitated it. Additionally, um, that there's no um, issue with focusing on doctors and staff, because it turns out when you make tools that improve the lives of doctors and staff 
invariably, um, patients wind up benefiting as well. Some major lessons learned, how to succeed. One, you need that provider with a passion um, to champion the story. Second, um, you have to create a sustainable business model. In whatever organization you're in, uh, the innovation needs to make business sense. Um, and third, uh, it has to be spread with IT, or it certainly is a lot easier if it's spread with IT. The classic example of you can create an innovation uh, on paper, but it's very hard to spread. When you incorporate it into the information technology of your organization, it becomes much easier to spread that innovation. Finally, I want to talk about something special that happened uh, at and after the Transform Conference in 2010. Um, I was fortunate enough to meet a young entrepreneur uh, who heard my story, saw that talk that I did a little earlier, and said, how might we make a company that actually does that? Uh, and the, that company um, was born Health Finch, or I often call it the Dr. Happiness Company, um, with a story about people meeting uh, who wanted to change healthcare, um, but they needed each other to actually make it happen. And so I came as an innovative physician with ideas. Um, John Barron, there's a high-tech entrepreneur um, looking for you know, the next great idea. Together, we were able to form something that's pretty darn cool. Uh, so that gets us to, can PowerPoint dreams really come true? Um, looking back, you might remember the uh, PowerPoints where I talked about how come we can't have an easier system to do refills uh, and automate that process and get it off my plate. For years, I've been talking about that, but no EMR vendor ever did it. No one ever did it. John said, I can do that. We can do this. Uh, and so I'm now going to show you a video, a lot slicker than any of the presentations that I did, uh, that explains and shows how we took this concept in these PowerPoints and actually created uh, a real product uh, that, uh, that people are using today. Um, so I'm going to pass off to another video, and after that, John's going to talk to you a little more about how this company came into being, what it is, um, what we've learned along the way, and, uh, and what the future might hold. There's no doubt about it, primary care providers are busy, and the added work outside of patient care leaves many feeling burnt out. Unfortunately, current electronic medical record systems can sometimes slow down providers even further. Prescription renewals are a perfect example. The average provider will spend 30 minutes clicking through an electronic medical record to find all the data they need to make a decision on over 14 requests per day. Providers can equip their staff with protocols, but a single staff member could spend their entire day processing requests for only 10 providers. Refill Wizard from HealthFinch is here to help. Refill Wizard provides evidence-based protocols that can be modified quickly based on your organization's unique needs. This includes things like changing visit frequency, lab checks, and more. With Refill Wizard, every renewal request entered into all scripts, whether by phone, fax, or through Sure Scripts, has your group's protocol automatically applied to it, and the result is sent to the inbox of the proper recipient. This means that the routine, repeatable requests get delivered to the staff while the difficult, challenging requests are sent to the provider. The comment field in the All Scripts task list provides complete documentation based on your protocols, including recommendations for the number of refills, return appointments, and lab follow-ups. When a renewal is sent to a staff member, it is pre-populated with the information provided in the protocols, which allows for quick sign-off. When a renewal is sent to a provider, they have instant access to all the information they need to make quick and accurate decisions. Refill Wizard delivers a simplified renewal process and better results for patients, providers, and staff. Visit RefillWizard.com today to learn more. So thank you very much, Lyle, for leading in and uh, telling the, the beginnings of the story of HealthFinch and how we kind of came together. Uh, this is Jonathan Barron speaking. I'm the co-founder and CEO of HealthFinch. And as Lyle mentioned, I was there on that uh, fateful day in, uh, in 2010 at Mayo Clinic as I was, uh, I was actually a graduate student. Um, so I was a graduate student at the time from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and with, my, and with our, our third co-founder, Ash Gupta, 
uh, we were there learning about uh, innovation. We were just getting our feet wet into the into the health IT world, um, and we knew that we wanted to start a company. But really, we were at the point where we needed a physician. We needed someone who understood uh, the nuances of the of the clinical world and um, the things that needed to be done, the apps that needed to be built. Um, at the time, during my my graduate research, I was very intrigued by this concept of the EMR as a platform for apps. Um, I, I, I'm from Madison. The uh, Health Venture is currently based out of Madison. And the company, we would see the biggest and the best uh, installs in, in the country. And we would see that they still, you know, they were still lacking something. And we knew that the next wave of health IT was going to be this app approach. Um, and so we were very intrigued by this. Um, but it took Lyle, bringing Lyle on to the company that really kind of catapulted us um, into the next phase. And so as um, as Lyle had mentioned, um, on that day, a, a company was born. That company, HealthFinch, um, we describe HealthFinch uh, as, as a cloud-based clinical decision support platform that takes the routine, repeatable work that docs are doing today and automates it by getting it off of their plate. And so to use this, to do this, we use the electronic medical record um, and we use the data that's housed within it. We use its, use its workflows. Um, and as you saw, you know, in a lot of ways, what we do today uh, is completely ingrained within the electronic medical record. Um, and our first product, which actually started right after uh, the end of Transform, was Refill Wizard, which was uh, Lyle's, or the initial stages were Lyle's Refill wiz widget that he showed uh, during this talk. And so Refill Wizard is a, a, exactly that same concept. The, the health finch concept of finding the easy work that, that we're asking doctors to do today um, and automating it. So what it, Refill Wizard is is a solution that we bring in, that we set up a protocol that works with the electronic medical record, and each time a prescription renewal request is received, we intercept it, we run it through the protocol, and in the majority of the time, we get it completely off the doctor's plate by allowing the, the staff uh, or the team to become more involved in the care. And through some of our first clients that we've gotten up and running on the solution, we're saving them 15 to 30 minutes a day. So at, just as Lyle uh, kind of alluded to during his talk, th these are the types of uh, the tools that become enabled once you have this EMR as, as a platform layer to build these, these cool new innovations on top of. Um, and so with, with the, the rem remaining amount of time today, I want to talk about a couple lessons learned. Uh, along the way, as we've kind of been building this, pro or building HealthFinch, building this company, and ultimately taking products and bringing them to market, um, and talk about some of the challenges. So the, the first, which Lyle uh, alluded to earlier, was to build for doctor happiness. One of the things that we've really seen today is, is it, the world today is completely. I mean, the health systems in general, physician groups are completely overwhelmed with the tasks that they have on their plate. Um, so adopting electronic medical records, ultimately moving to ICD-10, all these new initiatives, including, you know, ultimately moving to accountable care organizations, they just don't have the time to really take innovations, no matter um, how cool and how, uh, how interesting they might be, unless there's really a, a benefit for them. And what we've seen has really been a big factor in that is actually is, is doctor time and doctor satisfaction. Um, so many of these organizations have struggled to get up on the electronic medical record and struggled to, to make that transition from paper to electronic um, that they need a win. They need a win for their organizations. Um, and these doctors, when you introduce tools to them that save them time, that's when we see really rapid uptake of, uh, of new technologies. And, and a big philosophy of ours at HealthFinch is once you begin to get some of that work off their plate, once you begin to take uh, the easy stuff off their plate, that's when we can start to introduce some of these cool, new, innovative ways of thinking about this. But it's not until, you know, they actually have uh, enough time to do it can that actually happen. Um, so that was lesson number one. Lesson two um, it, it is is the second line that we're seeing on the screen right now, which is build for both a fee-for-service world and for an accountable care world. Uh, because, quite frankly, the challenge today is that many, so many organizations are moving to accountable care um, organizations, but at the same time, they don't really know what that ultimately is going to look like. Um, and so today, if you're an innovator, if you're trying to build things and get them out to market and push adoption, 
Um, if you're, you're, you're almost building for, for another startup right now, you're building for a startup organization that doesn't know what its goals are necessarily are. It doesn't know how it's going to function in a couple of years. And so really today, you have to be building for today's world. You have to be building for a fee-for-service world. Um, but at the same time, you have to have your transition plan in place for making that, that transition to the accountable care world. Um, and the way that we've been able to accomplish that with refills so, you know, refill requests, no matter the type of organization, no matter if you're in a fee-for-service world or if you're in an accountable care world, uh, this is work that has to be done. This is work that is going to be on the plate regardless of the, the financial models that are in place. And so it, it is in everyone's best interest, no matter the stage, to get that work done as efficiently as possible. Uh, so I think in, in making these, bringing new innovations to market, uh, you have to have an understanding of what the current market is today, but also how you're going to transition to this future state once we get there. Uh, the third lesson learned was that in, in a lot of ways, so we started out uh, in, in our refill wizard journey, um, it, much like Lyle kind of showed during that video. So in a way that was very visual, in a way that was very um, uh, friendly to the to the users, but at the same time, we kept coming back to this barrier which was organizations every time we talked to them and said, you know, we'd, we'd like to uh, talk to you about our new solution, Rico Wizard, that automates this prescription renewal process. They would say, great, but does it integrate? And I mean fully integrate into our electronic medical record. And so in some of our early days and some of our first prototypes, we built out these visual systems. We built out these separate user interfaces, but we kept coming back to, nope, they didn't, the health systems didn't actually want that. They wanted it to be completely integrated into the workflow. It, they wanted it to be completely integrated into the way that this work was getting completed today. Um, and so we've really taken this as a lesson learned that today, if you want to take an innovation and get it out and get it to market, you have to be willing to work within the electronic medical record. Uh, many organizations say, you know, are, are calling the, the EMR, the, it's their central place where the doctors spend their entire day. And if you're not integrated into that, if you're not baked into that workflow, um, it's ultimately going to be very, very challenging to get your innovation uh, to, to any sort of mass market. And, and then finally, our fourth lesson learned uh, is that we've really seen you know, over the next or over the last couple of years since 2010 that openness has really the next wave of health IT. Uh, we started out when we started out, and no EMR company thought of themselves as a platform. And now there's there's a handful of companies that have opened up their EMR that have said. You know, now it's time for us to start exposing APIs because we understand that there's more smart people outside of our organization than are within our organization. Um, and so we've really seen this proliferation of this, this app concept and these companies that are moving in that direction. And that's not to say that we're there yet and there's still uh, hurdles along the way, uh, but we really tru truly believe that the next, that the future is going to be modular, it's going to be app-based, um, and that's really where we're going to see the innovation drive, um, you know, the, the, next, uh, the next phase of health IT. And so with that, uh, to give you a, a sense of kind of our future vision at HealthFinch, so where we feel like uh, the world is going in 2025, um, where we really see that the, the patient or the doctor today as we know it, um, its role really changes substantially. Uh, we'd like to break these out into the, the – Think of the care, healthcare, into three separate chunks. So the first is the automated care, which is uh, the biggest chunk, and we think you know makes something uh, like 75% of all care that happens. So what this means is that things like a prescription refill comes in, and a prescription refill automatically goes out because it's following a, a, an order that the doctor has set up, uh, and no one needs to touch it unless unless something is wrong. So things like refills happen automatically. Things like labs happen automatically referrals, all this stuff that is, that is automatable ultimately gets automated. Um, and then only do things get, when they get escalated, do they reach the next level, which is the team, which makes up 20% of care as we see it. So this is the type of stuff that would involve telehealth or um, uh, on-site visits of the care team. So this is, again, not direct uh, physician supervision, um, but only that remaining 5% is actually spent on direct physician time. Um, and this time is spent with the patients that ha have the uh, uh, acute problems, the patients that are highly uncontrolled uh, on their chronic conditions. But rather than spending 20 minutes with each patient, uh, each doctor 
or, or each physician is able to spend up to an hour with each patient um, as the rest of the work, all the other work is either completely automated or, as Lyle has said, is delegated to the team. And so really, as HealthFinch continues to grow, this is, this is our uh, guiding light. This is our vision that we have for the future. And we're going to continue to chip away, starting with a, that big part piece, which is that, uh, that green piece, uh, to figure out what is the easy stuff that we can automate and how can we completely get that off of the physician's plate and also get that off the staff's plate um, so we can have everyone working to the top of the license. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your time today. And now uh, Lyle and I are going to open up for questions.